Hello and welcome to the webinar today. We'll be talking about USGv6 and IPv6 Ready Logo programs and mainly some of the testing that's available, some of the changes with the new revision of the USGv6 profile and going into more detail about testing that's available and what the testing process looks like. So we thank everybody for joining us today and let's get right into it. So in terms of an agenda, pretty brief one. We'll give an overview of USGv6, talk about the testing process. We'll include a demo of the IOL Intac software, talk about membership options and, and ways to get products to the lab for testing. And then of course, have some wrap up in Q&A. Speaking of Q&A, uh, as we're all probably fairly used to by now, feel free to use the question option in Zoom to ask any questions and we'll keep track as the webinar goes on. And as we get to the end, uh, work on answering some of those. We'll do the best we can to get to as many of the questions as possible. Um, if we do happen to miss one or two, we'll do our best to follow up after the webinar. My name is Timothy Carlin. I'm senior executive here at the lab and manage the technical side of all of the IPv6 and USGv6 and IPv6 Ready Logo testing here. Uh, also have a background in IP security and also one of the lead developers for the IOL Intact software. Hi everyone, um, my name is Michaela Newcomb. I'm the associate director here at the lab. Um, I work closely with Tim Carlin to manage and oversee um, some of the IPv6 um, and USGv6 programs that we offer here at the lab. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the key dates for both the IPv6 Ready Logo and USGv6 test programs. So back in June of 2020, um, Ready Logo stopped accepting applications for the version 408 um, core test specification. So this was a test spec that was primarily focused on RFC 2460, um, which is now obsoleted by RFC 8200. So this means to qualify for Ready Logo, you now must test for the new um, 5.1 test spec that's based on all the latest IPv6 RFCs. On the USGv6 side, in November of 2020, all the documents associated with USG Revision 1 or R1, as we like to call it, were published. So for USGv6, there's actually a two year window to comply with a new profile. Um, this means you can still test for the original version of profile. However, if you want to test both for Ready Logo and USGv6 simultaneously, you will need to test for the new requirements. So we get a lot of questions about how the requirements differ from IPv6 Ready Logo and USGv6. When possible, the two test programs do share the same test specifications to make it easier to test for both programs at the same time. Ready Logo does require 100% pass rate with the exception of advanced functionality test cases that are detailed in the test specification. Um, for USGv6, the easiest way to understand what's required um, is to reference the test selection tables, which can be found on the NIST website. Um, and the link is there as well. And we will share their slides. So you'll be able to access, access that link later. So the USGV6 profile speaks in terms of capabilities and we'll get more into those, what those capabilities entail and, and what the vocabulary around those are. But what they all come back to are the test plans itself, at least in the case of lab tested capabilities. So for those lab tested capabilities, first the IPv6 ready logo test plan. So those involve the core protocols, DHCP v6, IPsec and IPv2. These are the ones that overlap with the IPv6 ready program and for which a logo can be obtained. So as you can see here, these test plans are in slightly different states and that's due to updates in the RFCs and uh, to the test plans that are required to uh, maintain compatibility with those RFCs. So as you can see, core protocols, uh, those test plans have been finalized and that testing um, has been available um, now for several months. DHCPv6 is in progress, there are updates that were needed to both the test suites and 
uh, many of the automated test scripts. IPsec and IKV2, the drafts for those have been posted and testing will be available very soon for those. Also, there are other test plans that are outside the IPv6 Ready Logo program, but are included in the USGv6 program under their own capabilities. For those, we're talking about address architecture, which has been finalized, IPv6 only, which we'll get to in a moment, and then a couple of um, more product specific test plans, namely uh, those for routing OSPF v3 and BGP. Those are nearing completion. In the case of OSPF v3, it has been finalized and testing is recently available. And BGP 4 plus is uh, coming up very soon. Uh, network protection devices or network protection products as the USGv6 profile um, names them. That has a final draft which is posted and testing will be available very, very soon. Lastly, there is an application test plan. This is a custom test plan to handle devices that uh, run on top of an operating system or products that run on top of an operating system or applications that you know, will need to perhaps handle IPv6 addresses or DNS, but maybe aren't implementing a full protocol stack. And the USGv6 profile goes into some detail about applications. Um, what the plan is for those is that we expect to be making uh, somewhat customized tests and test plans uh, to handle the unique differences between um, the, the many different types of applications. As I mentioned, IPv6 only is a new capability with the USGv6 R1 profile. There is a draft test plan available and we uh, certainly encourage any questions or comments on all test suites and in particular this one um, to the email reflector listed here. So what we talk about with IPv6 only are a few things. Mainly we're talking about installation, upgrade and update, configuration, management, and instrumentation. There's a lot of loaded words there, of course, but really what we're looking to see is that with IPv6 only, that a product is able to operate in the same and expected way that would have operated in an IPv4 environment. The Big difference, of course, being that IPv4 isn't provisioned in any way. Um, there won't be any router listening to IPv4, no DHCP v4, or anything of the like on the network. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> everything that is available is IPv6 only. So the idea is that a product will have um, no deficiencies and will operate in the same way in that environment um, with respect to those categories that I mentioned previously. So I mentioned, you know, there's uh, likely to be some differences here in products and um, particularly product types with what may happen here. So uh, this test plan is under development. We're looking for comments here and, and we certainly look forward to feedback on those things. So next I'm gonna talk a little bit about the SDOC. This is a document that only applies to the USGv6 test program. It's essentially a way to communicate a set of IPv6 capabilities a product supports. Unlike ReadyLogo, USGv6 has a very large set of capabilities that a product can claim support for. Um, so these capabilities can either be lab tested or self-declared based on if a test plan exists. Um, so that kind of goes back to ReadyLogo and how the two programs share test plans. Um, if a test plan does exist, um, the, the testing does need to be performed in an ISO accredited test lab. And then, so after a test slot and you're looking to create an SDOC, um, that's something that the UNH IOL can assist with. Um, and we also maintain a list of USGv6 tested products on our website. So I'm gonna talk about some of the common misconceptions. I think the biggest one we hear um, it is this notion of USGv6 certified. Um, so USGv6 is not a hardline certification program like ReadyLogo is. It's really based on describing what your product supports um, through capability summary strings. Um, and that you, you'll see an example here. And our, and our hope is to see agencies start to define and publish these capabilities that they're looking for to really help the, the vendor community um, so because it's not a hardline certification program, it's really important for users to examine the SDOC. Um, having an SDOC does not necessarily mean that it's met a particular set of capabilities. So 
So speaking more about the capabilities, the U Series 6 profile lists some of what we're calling requirement statements or these capability summary strengths. Um, section five has a list of um, some of these uh, examples and default requirement statements. Um, what we're aiming for is to kind of give not just an example, but uh, what a baseline uh, set of requirements might look like for each of these uh, different types of uh, capability strengths. So this is something that's available on the SDOC, as Michaela mentioned. So a device that would uh, support all of the capabilities for USGV6 capable router, for example, would be able to check off that box uh, on the SDOC. And it would be an easy way to um, indicate that support to um, any buyers. Um, you know, as we mentioned, the idea is not that this is hardline. This is sort of a set and a default. Um, of course, um, products and suppliers or agencies may be able to define and build their own sets of capability summary strings to define um, their unique capabilities. So now we'll jump in a little bit to the testing process um, and exactly how we get from all of these test plans and capabilities and requirements and actually get to the end result of a report and SDOCs. So the first step um, is to join a testing service. We have a slide later to talk more about the different options. Um, and then we also do offer software that allows you to pretest for the program. Um, so right now we're going to take a pause and have a demo of the software that we offer um, to help you pretest for the USGV6 and Ready Logo test programs. So the iWill Intact software it can be licensed for pretesting purposes. And this is to get um, you know, some increased level of confidence that products are ready um, you know, to be sent to the lab. And um, you know, like I said, have a higher confidence that testing will go smoothly. Um, without any issues. So to do that, we'll switch over to the demo. Hi everyone, my name is Kai Ouellette. I'm a project manager for our IP Technologies Group. And today I'm going to be giving you a little introduction to our Iowa and Tech software, as well as a brief demo of the software. IOL Intact is software that we develop and commercialize. It's ideal for any in-house pretesting needs for IPv6 Ready Logo and USGV6. One of the main benefits of using IOL Intact for your in-house pretesting is that this is the exact software that we use in our lab to perform certification testing. This obviously has the upside where you have the highest level of confidence that the results that you're seeing with the Intact tool are exactly what we'll be seeing when we uh, run through your certification testing. Another upside to this is that while performing pretesting, you can potentially catch and fix any issues that you find prior to sending in your device for a certification run. This in the end saves a lot of time and money. Now that we have a basic understanding of what Intact is and what it does, let's take a look at a demo. The first thing that we'll see when you install and license Intact is the result loader panel. This is a panel that offers you the ability to create new testing sessions or load existing ones that you have on your system. For the purpose of this demo, I don't have any pre-existing sessions to load, so we'll go ahead and create a new one. One of the things you can do is give it a test label. So in this case, we'll just call it demo. And you will select your package and or playlist. Uh, we use package and playlist uh, interchangeably. So, you know, if you hear me say one or the other, I'm talking about the same thing. When you license the software, you'll be licensing a specific package. So this might be core host or core router, or perhaps IPsec. We also have a variety of other packages that we offer that you can find on our website. For the sake of the demo, I'm going to be using the IPv6 core host playlist. So I select that from the dropdown and I can click go. This is then going to create a new test session for us that you can see here. The very first window that you'll be dropped to is the device under test configuration, as well as the capture configuration. These configuration fields uh, will be filled in with information for your specific device under test. For the purpose of this demo, I already have a device preloaded, so I'm going to go ahead and load that config. 
any capture config or device config that you enter will save and uh, be available in this dropdown for future test sessions. The next thing that we'll look at is the results summary tab. Now, this is the tab that lists all of the test cases available to the given playlist. As you can see in the top right here, we can see that we have the core host release 5.1 loaded. And these are the test cases associated with them. Each one of these test cases has a direct one-to-one -one mapping with the test specification. The test specification is the documentation of each one of these tests, and it documents certain things like the purpose of the test, what RFCs are being tested, as well as you know, the procedural steps of the test and the expected outcomes of each step for the device under test. Now, let's take a look at running some test cases and what that might look like for you. For this purpose, I'm going to run 111, 112, and then I will also run 311 to show an example of some notifications, which we'll see in a second. So right now I have these three tests selected. I identify that by the blue highlight, and I can go ahead and click Start. After clicking Start, you'll be immediately taken to the Dashboard tab. This is a tab that offers two primary components. The first is this log. As you can see here, we're getting a live feed of the test and the log as it's executing. So we can see that it started running uh, test 111. We got a pass, and we can see some of the logging information in between. The second aspect is the notifications panel. This is a panel that will pop up when there's some action that needs to be performed. In the case of 311, it requires performing duplicate address detection on the device under test. And we can see that I get a notification about initializing interface A. It's waiting for a DADNS from the, the nut, uh, which is note under test, synonymous with device under test. So if I quickly off screen, go ahead and disable and enable my interface on my device under test, we'll see that that notification just disappeared. The reason it disappeared was because the prompt was met I performed DAD on my device, uh, which was off screen. You didn't see that. And the device under test sent the specific packet that the test script was looking for. After it saw that, it moved on with the test and it determined that it was a pass. There's also to the right, this active test panel. This is purely informational. It just gives you an idea of what tests are currently being executed and where they stand. All three completed, so you can see that they were complete. But if you were looking while the tests were running, you would see that uh, one of them at a given time was marked as running and the others might have been marked as queued. So now that we've run and executed some tests, let's take a look at what we can do with some of the information that was captured. If we go back to the results summary tab, we'll see now that test 111, 112, and if we scroll down to 311, they all are being marked as a pass now. If we want more information about a given test, we can go ahead and double click on it. What this will do is open up the detailed view of the given test case. This gives you a list of all of the test runs that have been performed. We can see that there's one passing test run, which is the one that we just ran. The skip test run is there by default, and there's no information here. What we can see in the bottom left is the log specific to this one test run. This is the same exact log that we saw in the dashboard, except it's only for this given 111 test, as opposed to in the dashboard, we saw the running log of every test. The other thing we can see if we scroll to the bottom of the log is the device configuration that was used while running the test. This can be really helpful comparing results that maybe passed and then maybe failed in making sure that your configuration is similar across both of those runs and that there are no discrepancies there. We can also see in the top right quadrant that there is a comment section. This is the ability to add a comment to any given run. Sometimes this might be confirming the pass if you looked at the packet capture, which we'll see in a second, or this might be trying to just document uh, what you're seeing for a given fail. In the bottom right, we can see the captures window. Here we see net zero, which is the name of the network that we were capturing on. This is hand in hand with what we see in the configuration tab under capture configuration. We can see here that the label is net zero. If we have Wireshark installed and we have PCAP NG's default application set to Wireshark, we can go ahead and double click on this given network and we'll see that the Wireshark capture associated with this test run is then opened up in Wireshark. 
This is very helpful for fails occur, opening the Wireshark capture and debugging it hand in hand with the test specification, ensuring that the steps and the expected results are met and identifying which expected result may not have been met in the case of a fail. Now that we've seen the configuration window, the dashboard while tests are running, the results summary panel, and a detailed test review, I want to go ahead and show you what Intact looks like to load existing results. In order to load results in Intact, we need to first get back to the results loader panel that we saw earlier in the demo. We can do this in one of three ways. The first option is from a session, clicking File, Close. This will close the given session and bring us back to the results loader panel if we only have one session window open. In this case, we did, so it came back to the results loader. Another option is by clicking File, New Session. Again, this brings us back to the results loader panel, but the difference that you can see here is that our demo session is still open in the background. The difference here is from this results loader panel, we can select a different set of results, and if we were to open it, it would replace this given session with those results. None of your data is lost, everything is saved, it's just merely replacing this given window. The third and final option is by closing intact and restarting it. When you launch intact, the very first thing you'll be greeted with is the results loader panel to load your set of results that you'll be using. The next time we visit the results loader panel, we'll first be taken to this load tab as opposed to the new tab that we first started at. We can see here there's a drop down with all of our existing results. For the sake of the demo, I just have the one demo session that you guys saw me make. And what we can do is we can click on this and we can click go. And this will go ahead and open up the session. Now, everything here that you saw me do previously is all stored. So we have all of our results that we ran. In this case, it was these three test cases. The configuration is saved. So we can quickly go back to the results summary and click start again on a test and we don't have to reconfigure anything. And all of the detailed information is still there. So once this test finishes, I'll double click on the detailed results for this. And we can see that the new run that I just ran is here and the existing run is here as well. So all of this information is stored and is accessible uh, after the fact. That about wraps it up for this very high level demo. One thing I will mention is there are some more advanced automation features that I will intact offers that I'm not going to be demonstrating today. Some of these things are device automation. In one of the test cases, you saw that the dashboard had a prompt for performing DAD. We have automation in place that you can plug in commands to automate your device and perform that duplicate address detection automatically. Some other automation we have is a fully featured CLI interface. This is helpful for scripting automated testing. And we also have a REST API that isn't yet fully featured, but that's in the works and we hope to have that, that be fully featured in a future release. That's all I have for today's demo and I just wanted to thank you for the time. And we thank Kyle Ouellette, our lead developer for the Ireland Tech software for providing us that demo today. And speaking of, the Owl Intact software is available uh, for licensing, as we mentioned, and trial licenses are available if you'd like to give it a try um, to see how it may work in, in your lab um, to do some of that in-house pre-testing. Um, it's certainly helpful for using the same tool that is used by the IOL when we run the testing. And we're more than happy to help with getting that tool set up and reviewing any results and captures to make sure that the devices are performing as expected. So speaking of the testing process itself, we've only really covered that first top third of the process itself. Um, of course, pre-testing is optional um, and we're here to help with either option uh, you may make um, right through to the end. So in either case, whether you've pre-tested or not, um, we help you schedule testing and get in our calendar um, to get ready to come to the lab. So once you're, you have a test slot um, and you're ready to come to the lab, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, really, we just need the equipment um, here on site if it's a physical device. We also um, are able to test any kind of virtual device. We have the infrastructure to 
just um, spin up a virtual machine if that's um, the, your type of device. Um, and after that, we'll, we'll run the testing. We'll be in touch with you um, about any issues we're seeing, if we have any questions about the device. Um, and then we'll provide a report. Um, and if you're looking for USGV6, we'll help you with the SDOC. And if you're interested in Ready Logo as well, we'll also help you submit that application and walk you through that process. Speaking of our testing services, there are several different membership options depending on um, the, your device type and depending on the protocols that you may be interested in testing for. Um, so there are four different areas that we mentioned briefly earlier, uh, the IPv6 host membership, the IPv6 router membership, the firewall membership, and IPv6 application. In terms of IPv6 host, the protocols that are covered here are the IPv6 core protocols, address architecture, DHCP, IPsec and IPv2, and MLDV2. Router includes the same, but also adds to it the DHCP v6 server and relay agent, MLDV2 router, as well as IPsec IPv2 security gateways. And of course, our routing protocols, OSPF v3 and BGP. Firewall includes testing for firewalls, IDS, IPS, and generally network protection products. And lastly, we touched on IPv6 application a little bit earlier, and that's sort of a catch-all for products that are generally software-based, but at least don't fit well in perhaps any of the other protocol spaces where we might look at developing some customized test solution for those devices. Michaela mentioned briefly during the testing process slide, um, the various platforms that we may need to test with. Of course, we're very familiar with hardware and the shipping process for getting devices back and forth from the lab and, and very ready to handle um, those devices of any size and getting them uh, powered and, and connected to our test bed. Software or virtual appliances are also an option. and That's pretty straightforward as far as uploading and. As Michaela mentioned, we have the virtual infrastructure able to handle most virtual appliances. Lastly, we do hear a lot of questions about testing for cloud applications or cloud native products. This is a little bit tricky um, and we're still working on this methodology with, with NIST and other, um, and other collaborators. Um, the first thing that we're really looking at confirming with cloud is that these products can be access, accessed from an IPv6 only um, source. So imagine you're sitting at the office or at some site um, with the product in the cloud, your site is IPv6 only. We wanna make sure that that cloud product is still accessible and is still performing um, as, as expected. Um, almost similar to IPv6 only, except that you know it's reverse in that we can't really test the cloud environment to ensure that it is IPv6 only. So it's more about the access uh, and getting to that cloud product um, than, than its environment itself. But as I mentioned, this is under development and we're still looking at what some options may be here for um, more in-depth testing. So lastly, before we open it up for Q&A, we're just gonna talk about um, a few frequently asked questions we get. Um, so the first one is what's going to happen to all the SDOCs um, and all the products that are currently listed for the original version of the profile. Our plan here is to keep the listing site up. Um, it represents years and years of work um, and um, we want to keep that history from for vendors um, up there. So we're, we don't plan on taking it down. We've already put up the new R1 listing site, so it'll be very clear. Um, which site is for what version of the profile. Um, and then the second question here, um, does our product need to pass everything? Um, so again, for USGV6, it's really about um, different capabilities and what you're claiming support for. So you must pass um, everything in that test selection table um, to claim support for a given capability.
So with that, I think we'll move to um, some Q&A that we've seen, some questions that we've seen trickle in as we've been speaking here today. Um, again, feel free to continue to send in questions and we'll get to as many as we can over the next few minutes. Um, so there was a question um, regarding our timeframe for uh, existing test plans and potentially some newer test plans for the capabilities listed in the profile. So we've been working hard to update um, the existing test plans first and get them um, compatible with new, RF new RFCs and new, new requirements. Um, I would say that by the end of the year, we should be um, completely finished with the existing uh, test plans and working on um, adding to the set of test plans to include some other capabilities that have been listed. There's another question regarding um, the percent overlap between IPv6 Ready logo and USGV6 tests. Um, I think it's important to, to point out first um, that not all of the USGV6 um, capabilities are covered by logo, um, but generally I would say it's pretty close to um, pretty close to 100%. There are some tests that logo covers that are not required by USGV6 and vice versa. There are a couple required by USGV6 for which the requirements are slightly different in logo. Um, again, we're, we're, when it comes down to the details of those test cases, um, we're very happy to talk about those and, and uh, explain those in detail um, as, as those come up. Um, but generally we see that, um, they, as we mentioned, they're pretty much in, in agreement and in alignment and uh, compatibility with one generally gets you um, very close on the other. So there's another question here um, regarding timelines. I just realized we got to the end here and I think it might be nice. Here we are, so you can see me. <laughs> um, so there's another question here regarding testing timelines. We didn't really cover this in the testing process slide. Um, so when we're talking about the testing process, uh, it definitely includes some device setup um, getting things plugged in and online in our test bed. Um, in some cases, retests or situations where we already have the hardware, that's uh, pretty straightforward and we've already have it set up unless there's any software or firmware updates that need to be made. Um, as part of the USGV6 testing program though, um, we do undergo a fairly rigor rigorous ISO 17025 accreditation, um, which we, as we mentioned, we're, we're pretty strict on to make sure that we are um, you know, remaining compliant and providing a high quality of service. Um, that includes validating all of our test scripts, validating all of our connections, um, and a thorough review of all the test cases that are run. So I would say, depending on the protocols that are chosen for testing, and this varies from vendor to vendor or from product to product, um, it, it may take as few as um, you know, two to four weeks for the base protocols, uh, or as many as four to eight weeks if other IPsec, DHCP, or routing protocols are included. Um, and in some cases, it may go beyond that. It really depends on the product and, and the protocols that are selected. Um, again, if, if timelines or if, it, um, if there's a desire to fit within a particular sprint schedule, um, we're happy to um, work with you to accommodate those timelines as best we can. So just reach out to us and we'll, and we'll do our best to accommodate um, any deadlines you may have. Um, there was a, a quick question about configuration and intact regarding um, link local or global addresses. Um, and in this case, the um, while some tests may be able to be run with only link local, um, in general, both the uh, IPv6 Ready logo and USGV6 profile do require that devices pass with both types of addresses, as well as unique local and site local. So there's a question here about um, what does SDOC stand for? SDOC stands for Supplier Declaration of Conformity. So the SDOC really is owned by 
the product manufacturer. We're just here at the IOL to help you um, create the document, but the SDOC does belong to the, to the supplier. And there's also a question here about how long is the backlog for testing? It varies, but at any given time, um, I would say it's, it's around a month to actually get a test slot and get in the schedule. So another one um, in regards to the membership options and the firewall versus IPv6 router memberships. Uh, firewall is included in its own membership and the, uh, the IPv6 router membership would not include those um, NPP tests. So those are included under different um, memberships. Let's see, scrolling down. Um, one thing that we didn't point out, um, both programs are focused on, um, first and foremost, the IPv6 stack um, and how that is operating. On a given device, um, if you're thinking a server device, um, a typical operating system, that would typically only be one stack. However, with other um, products, routers, switches, some firewalls, of course, um, there may be two or potentially more IPv6 stacks um, performing different functions. So you're thinking about management interfaces um, versus management and control interfaces versus data interfaces. Um, in those cases, um, you know, a management interface might be operating as a host while the data interfaces may be operating as a router or a switch. So in that case, those could be um, different test options, different engagements, and potentially different uh, SDOCs um, in the end. So the testing for that actually looks pretty straightforward and pretty similar to um, any other testing with the one caveat that we didn't mention and we neglected to include a slide for this, that all of our testing is actually done in an IPv6 only environment. So that does raise some um, um, interesting things that need to be solved with regards to managing and controlling the device, um, particularly making sure that it supports being managed in an IPv6 only environment. And this is the um, sort of a precursor in foreshadowing the IPv6 only capability for USGV6, but it also meets the new requirements for the IPv6 ready logo in that a product uh, wishing to achieve the logo must be tested in a lab and the test must be run um, over IPv6 only. So in other words, the device doesn't, isn't provisioned with an IPv4 um, management address um, well, we test with IPv6 um, on the data side, for example. Um, and that's really just to, um, is another way to um, drive the adoption of IPv6 and to um, begin the migration and sunsetting of the V4. There's a question here about um, a detailed link that describes the specific differences between R0 and R1. That's really a question. We actually had a webinar last year um, that we hosted with NIST that really went um, deep into the technical differences. So we can also link that out as well when we share this webinar. There's another question um, regarding how USGV6 and IPv6 ready um, may or may not um, align or, or be leveraged by uh, DOD. Um, that's something that um, we are um, monitoring, keeping an eye on. And as soon as we have any detailed information to share there, um, we will certainly help share it. I, I suspect though that we will find out about any um, requirements there at the same time as, as most others. Um, so I, that, that discussion is ongoing. Um, and again, if, if there's anything to share there, we'll do our best to um, share that with you. And yeah, an interesting question here um, as far as the um, media 
that we test uh, the stacks through. So thinking about um, wireless versus wired, Wi-Fi, um, you know, coming back to IP6 stacks, if it, oftentimes um, those just appear as separate interfaces for the device under test, and it's utilizing the same stack underneath. Um, in those cases, um, we do like to take the path of least resistance, which is often um, wired or, or Wi-Fi um, testing. Um, there are some situations where those stacks may be different, and we can work with you on making sure any, that we've accounted for any differences there, and if necessary, tested both. Um, there, uh, sometimes there are questions about um, uh, cellular, um, be it 4G, 5G, or, or LTE, something like that. Um, you know, those have their own requirements and um, are in, in many cases dramatically different um, from others depending on their very specific use cases. Um, so there are some challenges with testing those types of interfaces and actually some differences in even what can be tested. Um, so that's something that we would have to work with um, individual um, suppliers and, and devices on. So it does look like questions have just about um, slowed down. Um, we'll hang on just one more minute in case there's a last question, but um, we will be wrapping up here shortly. I wanted to share um, some links for more information. Um, of course, the USGV6 program itself, uh, the website here, which contains um, information specific to R1, um, as well as the IOL Intact uh, mailer, so Intact IOL at UNH.edu. And of course, for any lab inquiries, uh, feel free to contact uh, Michaela or myself anytime. I'd be happy to jump on a call as needed um, to discuss uh, any questions you may have. Um, we also referenced um, different things like the test suites and the test selection tables. You'll likely be able to find all of that information either by starting at the IOL website or by starting at the USGV6 R1 website. So with that, I want to thank everyone for attending today. And we really appreciate your support. And as I mentioned, any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks again.